Siege of Jadotville. What if your country volunteers your infantry battalion to go on a peacekeeping tour for six months in the deep countryside of the Katanga province in Africa? Now imagine being told that the rules of engagement restrict you from firing your weapon on anyone, even armed rebels, and only as a last resort. Well, those were the rules of engagement that the United Nations Security Council adopted on February 21, 1961, in which the peacekeepers had to obey, including the Irish 35th Infantry Battalion. But of course, there's a lot more to the story than that. In 1960, following the Congo's independence from Belgian colonial rule, this area known as Katanga declared its autonomy by its leader Moise Chambé in what was to be the start of a long, bloody civil war. The United Nations almost immediately intervened, sending a peacekeeping mission while a diplomatic solution could be found. The UN mission was most certainly backed by the United States, which depended heavily on the supply of uranium from the Katanga area, and by Belgium and France, which owned and controlled the vast mining operations there. However, the United States and Belgium saw the new leader of the Republic of Congo, Patrice Lumumba, as a tyrant with communist-leaning tendencies, and therefore a threat to the mining operations. The United States used the peacekeeping mission to create a stalemate while it figured out what to do with the Congo's leader. The CIA would be making plans to secretly poison Lumumba, but instead he would be toppled in September 1960 by a mostly bloodless military coup led by the pro-Western leader Colonel Joseph Mobutu. He would become the Congo's uncontested leader for the next 37 years. This change in the Congo's leadership presented an odd situation as Mobutu was now the favored leader by the U.S. and Katanga would not accept the United Nations proposal for a reunification of Katanga into the Congo. The civil war would continue with more UN peacekeepers sent to control and fight the Katanga rebellion, which were still supported by Belgium and France, placing the U.S. at odds with its own allies. It was hoped that the United Nations forces, made up mostly of peacekeepers from India, Sweden, and Ireland, would prevent any further escalation of the civil war and help buy the time for a diplomatic solution to the split of Katanga. In this backdrop, the Irish 35th Infantry Battalion arrived in the Republic of Congo on June 16, 1961, as part of the United Nations peacekeeping mission and was immediately deployed to the area around the city of Elizabethville, the capital of the breakaway Katanga province. This city is also a hub for the mining operation operations in the entire region, with improved roads and railroad connections to the mines as well as a large airport. And so in early September, a company of the Irish 35th Battalion, led by Commandant Pat Quinlan, would be sent to the town of Jadotville, about 80 miles or 128 kilometers northwest of Elizabethville. Ostensibly, the Irish contingent was sent there to protect the local population, as well as to provide an outer defensive perimeter to Elizabethville. However, Jadotville's close proximity to the Shinkolobwe uranium mines, located another 15 miles to the west, made it ideal as a staging area to protect the mines from falling into rebel hands. Commandant Pat Quinlan soon noted deep hostility towards his Irish peacekeepers from the local population while scouting the town. He then gave his men orders to dig deep trenches around their position, as well as to stockpile water and to carry their guns at all times. His instincts would prove vital to the men's survival several days later. That attack came on September 13th, 1961, while most of the men were attending mass at their compound. The quick-thinking Irish troops on guard duty in Quintland's prior preparations prevented the first wave of over 600 attackers from overrunning their position. The Irish in turn inflicted heavy casualties on the Cantonese attackers, which were led by mercenaries from Belgium, France, and Rhodesia. The attackers then began to encircle the Irish position at Jadotville with over 3,000 Cantonese forces. Some estimates have placed this figure at 4,000 to 5,000. In spite of superior numbers, the attacks would only come in waves of around 500 to 600 soldiers. At least one aerial bombing and strafing attack was also made against the Irish compound, and still the Irish suffered no casualties. None of the Cantonese attacks managed to penetrate the defensive positions and the Irish continued to hold their ground. However, by the third day of the siege, the Irish troops of A Company began to run low on ammunition and water. Commandant Pat Quinlan repeatedly called his superiors for additional supplies and reinforcements, but the requests were either ignored or denied. Part of the lack of reinforcements to A Company was due to the fact that other units from the Irish 35th as well as the Irish 36th Battalion were by now also in contact with enemy forces throughout the Elizabethville area. A column of reinforcements was eventually sent towards Jadotville, but was stopped by an attack from Cantonese forces just south of the bridge over the Lufira River. A United Nations helicopter would have 
eventually drop off several drums of water, but these were found to be unusable, as petrol drums had been used without proper cleaning and were now contaminated. Time was beginning to run out for the besieged Irish force in Jadotville. Commandant Quinlan was then able to negotiate a ceasefire with the mercenary commanders, who also wanted to collect their dead and wounded from the battlefield. But with the column of relief troops stuck fighting at the Lufira River Bridge and other forces engaged in heavy fighting elsewhere, there would be no reinforcements coming to Jadotville. The Kentuckys forces would also repeatedly break the truce, with several skirmishes and larger attacks taking place around the besieged Irish troops. Finally, on September 17, 1961, having run out of water and ammunition, and without any expectation of reinforcements or supplies, Commandant Pat Quinlan raised the white flag and was forced to surrender to the mercenary-led Cantigues forces. His men had sustained five wounded with no soldiers killed, while the Cantigues and mercenary forces had lost at least 300 killed and over 1,300 wounded. These figures have been estimated as high as 1,000 killed and 2,500 wounded. This would mean that the Irish forces had effectively destroyed over 50% of the attackers. Quinlan's surrender of A Company would save his soldiers to fight another day. The men were taken prisoner but released a few weeks later as part of the ongoing United Nations diplomatic talks aimed at stopping the general civil war. Ironically, after the release of the men of A Company, they would be redeployed again in the Elizabethville area and would see further combat for several more weeks until their tour of duty was over in December of 1961. The men of A Company 35th Battalion, and especially Commandant Pat Quinlan, would unfortunately not receive a hero's welcome back in Ireland. In fact, the men were criticized for their surrender and ostracized from the public. Commandant Quinlan's brilliantly executed defense and tactical defeat of a superior attacking enemy force is now cited in many military training manuals around the world as the best example of a perimeter defense strategy. The Cantigues forces would eventually be defeated in 1964 after a series of battles, thus ending the civil war and reuniting the Katanga province to the Republic of Congo under the rule of Colonel Mobutu. Moise Jombe, the leader of the failed Katanga nation, would go into exile in Algeria and suddenly die in 1969. His death remains shrouded in mystery, with some accounts indicating that the CIA poisoned him. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel as it really helps the algorithm.